Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our More of a Good Thing Roundtable series. We're really glad that you're here and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Next slide, please. My name is Joanne Reif Snyder. I'm at the University of Maryland and I have the pleasure of working with Aaron, who is uh, the architect of this work um, that's been ongoing now for several months. And um, we'll tell you a little bit probably next time about uh, the findings from these roundtables and how we're going to uh, disseminate those and build on what we've learned and shared during these roundtables. Next slide, please. So this is an adaptation of the age-friendly health systems framework, which um, is taking the country by storm. I'm very glad to say not only in hospital and health systems, um, but also in long-term care settings as well. And it focuses on um, four pillars, what are known as the four M's, what matters, medication, mentation, and mobility. And Aaron has adapted these to um, four pillars around caring for our care force uh, or workforce, which we're calling care force um, uh, a la Lori Porter, who's been teaching us about what it means to be a part of the nursing home care force. Next slide, please. So here are um, the sessions that we've had already. The recordings are available on the site. If you haven't um, heard some of these, there's only one that was not recorded. That was a short center rounds that uh, Dr. Beth Lone facilitated for us. Today, we're going to talk about health promotion and safety, and I'm going to introduce our guest in just a moment. And we have just two more sessions left, August and September. You can see what the topics are there, and we look forward to seeing you at those future roundtables. Next slide, please. So for those who are joining us for the first time, and you might not have heard me say this in the past, um, to level set what we're doing here, we are a community of folks um, focused on care in the long-term care setting, focused on co-design. How can we work together to build stronger care force? We adopted an all teach, all learn model uh, many of you have learned about that, worked with that through the ECHO project. We're all about small tests of change and each meeting, um, we have more or less time to be able to discuss, but we always ask, what could you implement right away? What did you hear that you could take to a stand up or a stand down or a next interprofessional meeting or a huddle um, for your own teams? And then as, uh, as I've said already, um, there is collation uh, going on already and dissemination of the insights that's planned. Next slide, please. So we're really delighted to have with us today, Dr. Kelly Doran. Kelly is an associate professor at the University of Maryland in the Department of Family and Community Health. And she's also the director of health and wellness for the University of Maryland at Baltimore Community Engagement Center. She's had um, a career focused on long-term care. And in particular, she's been looking at interventions to increase health promotion behaviors of staff working in long-term care. So she's really ideal to be with us today. Um, next slide, please. And Kelly, we are delighted. Welcome, and I'm gonna uh, turn it over to you. And I believe you wanted to be sharing your own slides now. Thank you. Give me one second while I open those up. Um, share my screen. Um, great. So thank you everyone for um, coming. I'm really excited to talk about worksite wellness within long-term care. It's one of my passions. Um, and I'm really excited about the conversations and to hear your ideas that we're going to get to later on after, um, after the short talk. I just want to give a nod of gratitude to the other collaborators and investigators that I worked with on the findings that I'm going to talk about. Barb Resnick, she's on Zoo, Karen Chen, and Lira Yoon. So we don't have a lot of time together, so I wanted to just start with giving you a foundation for worksite wellness. I'm sure you already know, but a profile of some of the long-term staff care staff, and then also some of the lessons learned from the projects that I've worked on, and then some small takeaways for things that you can start immediately next week. So 
if I, I'm sure you came here with this idea of like, I want to create this amazing culture, this wonderful worksite wellness relaxation, people are going to love increased job satisfaction. And hopefully we're going to get there. But today we're really going to focus on a small subset, a small change that you can make that's still beautiful. It can still be impactful and still meaningful. So before, when I start working with facilities, I always, when I'm giving them my pitch about the project we want to run there, I always give them the start of why they want to do it. What's the benefit for employees? What's the benefit for employers, right? And we know that employees are going to be healthier. We know there's a spillover to the residents. And we also know that there's a return on investment. The literature shows us that it can be anywhere from 2 to $4 on average. It can go up to $5. Um, we also know that that return on investment takes three plus years to achieve. Um, I just wanted to start with a, a little bit of a foundation of what are some of those common elements that need to be in a comprehensive program. And so the literature tells us that if we're designing a program and we want it to be successful, we want to have that ROI, these are the elements that we need. Um, these five core elements. On a national survey, when you look at employers across all sectors, you can see down at the bottom about 20% are offering all five of those components. And I thought this was important to share here because what we know when, um, when employers are offering worksite wellness, it takes about five years. You're, more, you're three times more likely to have a comprehensive program if your program's been going for five or more years. So everybody starts small, starts with these small changes, and it's a constant culture. It's a, lot, it's a lifetime journey. The other foundational piece I wanted to tell you before we get started is NIOSH, NIH, researchers who are doing worksite wellness are really looking towards the total worker health model. And this is a big change because even when I started in worksite wellness about 15 years ago, there was, there was pockets that were doing health promotion, doing occupational safety and health. And what we're learning is if we really want to make a change and really want to impact employees, health outcomes, return on investment, and um, spill over to our patients and residents, we need to start looking at comprehensive programs. And so here are the four areas that they're suggesting that to have that kind of, that we wanna to touch on. And so just to give you a, again, I could spend hours just talking about this, but workplace psychosocial conditions, here are just a couple of examples. And then I also wanted to put in a little bit of how that ties into health, right? So we know that if employees are reporting low decision latitudes in their job, and then also increased demand, they're more likely to experience pain, have obesity, higher CBD risk, and sleep issues. We also know that if we can change some of the behaviors, right, their exercise, sleep habits, diet, tobacco usage, we have shown in the literature that that's going to increase workability and improve some health outcomes. We also know that we want to look at home and community environment factors. And here again are just a couple of examples of what that could include. I thought it was really important to focus, um, for give, to give an example around social determinants of health, because just looking at nursing assistants, for example, we know nationally that um, about 34% of nursing assistants receive some type of public assistance so that we can assume that there might be some social determinant stressors. That might be something that we want to include. And again, just some examples of workplace, physical, and chemical environment, and some health um, changes that we can make. Okay, so when we want to start implementing some interventions, what could those interventions look like? So here are the first six are the most common that you're going to see if an employer is offering a worksite wellness. These are the programs that they're offering. And so, for example, if you're offering an HRA, which is a health risk appraisal, in order to have a comprehensive program or a successful health risk appraisal program, these are some of the elements that you want to include. Screening with individual feedback, some health coaching, providing referrals, and then re-following up with those employees within at least a year. And so, for each different types of programs that you want to offer, there's best practices, right? Um, I put a star next to tobacco and clean air because I'm going to talk about that in another minute, but I think that's particularly important for this population. The other reason I put a star next to the mood stress depression is because I think that's a real missed opportunity. Um, when you survey employers nationally, only about 20% are offering 
mood, stress, depression programming for their staff. And we know, right, just with the long-term care, we know it's a stressful environment. This was even before COVID, and we know that the stress has gone up. So this is a real opportunity for us to offer these types of programs. And stress is so important. Not only is it a direct risk factor for disease, right? It's also an indirect risk factor because we know if you're stressed, you're less likely to exercise, eat healthy, have sleep, have sleep issues. And then also you're less likely to retain and engage in retain information and engage in programming. So it's an important area. <clears throat> so this is just an example from our work of what the typical profile of a long-term staff looks like. In the projects that we've used, the beginning projects, we focused just on nursing assistants. And I think that was a real downside or an error on our side. If we're really trying to change the culture, we need to work with all the staff. So that our first project was just nursing assistants. Then we moved forward to all staff. Um, so this data that I'm talking about is just for about 50% are nurses, nursing assistants. The rest are housekeeping, dietary, maintenance, admin. Um, and so you can see blood pressure, uh, cholesterol within normal limits. But there is a great opportunity to, um, to engage these staff in wellness behavior because you can see they have some poor behavioral outcomes, right? High, high BMI, not getting enough sleep, poor sleep quality, high fat diets. Another piece that's really interesting, one of the things we hear all the time, if we go in to a work site, we wanna do an exercise intervention, we hear, I don't need exercise, I'm on my feet all day, I'm exhausted when I leave here. But we put some fancy pedometers on people that measured step counts and also aerobic activity. And we found that staff are in this low active, low active group. So meaning that they're really not meeting the threshold. And interestingly, when we looked at how much they're engaging in aerobic activity, on average, it was zero. So we, we know now that there's obviously opportunities for education and about the difference of physical activity versus exercise, and then opportunities to increase those numbers. The other thing that we learned that I thought was surprising is about 40% of the population that we were working with for the sample was exposed to passive smoke secondhand smoke. And we know that that can increase your risk for heart disease up to 35%. So again, this is a missed opportunity, um, an area that we can intervene on. <clears throat> so this data is very preliminary, but I just thought it was perfect opportunity. We just got it this week. So I thought it was a perfect opportunity to share because this is um, what we did is we wanted to really understand stress because I think it's so important to get at the stress levels if we're trying to change any other behaviors within the work environment. And so we really wanted to understand what's going on, why are people stressed, what's that look like, and then can we provide individualized stress interventions. So we put these bio um, artificial sensors on individuals to measure physiological measures of stress. And then we also sent things to their cell phones so they could tell us about the intensity and descriptors of their stress. Some of the quick findings that we found is about, this was just nursing assistants. We found that half of their stress came from a resident interaction and about 20% came from actual negative self-talk, self-rumination, something within themselves. Another piece that I thought was interesting for this talk was that about two thirds of the stress occurred off shift. And that's really important because a lot of times when we offer worksite wellness programming, it's typically during the day shift. Night shift is always the last to offer programming to, and evening shift sometimes not so much. Another thing that I thought was really interesting and that I wanted to share was that we were finding that stress was happening everywhere. There was no opportunity to escape stress. It was happening when people left the building to go on their break to go get coffee. It was happening in the break room where they were eating. It was happening in the gym. Everywhere um, they were going, they were feeling some, they were reporting stress. And uh, we, when we asked people to, we did interviews with people to truly understand the details of that stress, the biggest stress sources that came out so far in this preliminary analysis were rigid schedules, feeling rushed, disrespect, um, patient safety, feeling just emotionally and mentally depleted, and then personal stress, right? So not only are it a stressful work environment, but outside things are going on that are stressful for people. I'm sure no surprise to you, but I wanted to just make sure as we're thinking about interventions, we're kind of looking at the whole picture of what's going on with folks. So once we had um, 
got people into the program, we turned around and asked them, what was it that made you sign up for this program? What did you want to get out of the program? Um, I recognize that I'm not going into all the different programs just because we don't have a lot of time. We wanted to save a lot of our time to kind of talk and brainstorm how this is going to work at your facility. Um, but just a quick blur, our program we offered, they're usually about nine months to a year long with an intensive intervention. We go on site and offer a variety of wellness pro um, programs, exercise, diet, tobacco, sleep, stress, um, all at the work site. We're also working on some organizational and policy changes. So it's a quick little blurb about it. Um, so when we asked people why they joined, we heard biggest things where I wanted to improve my health. I'm working in a facility where I'm caring for people that are 100 years old. I don't know anybody that's 100, but I wanna to live to be 100. Um, I wanna get off this blood pressure medication or diabetes medication. I have arthritis in my back or my knees. I wanna decrease my pain. We also heard that I needed some outside boost in self-efficacy. We also heard that I really wanted to bond and connect with my coworkers. And I thought that the program would help them do that. Now, once we had people in the program, we asked them what some of the biggest facilitators were for keeping them engaged in the program. Hands down, the biggest thing we heard was that it was fun and it was enjoyable. Um, in a little bit, I'm gonna talk about how we did that and how we tried to model it around, you're doing a great job when you're here, we want you when you leave to be able to feel refreshed and rejuvenated and to do kind of like a mental swipe out. And so we tried to make it really fun and engaging. And we actually had residents that would come because they loved the energy, the music, um, and would engage in the exercise sessions with us or um, help you taste test or anything like that. So we just tried to really make like a facility-wide culture fun. The other thing we heard is that there was low pressure, right? We rolled with resistance. If people ghosted us or didn't show up or behavior change is hard, and so we really just tried to provide this welcoming and supportive environment. Another thing that we found that was pretty successful is we did a lot of competitions. We heard time and time again that employees did not want to compete against each other. They wanted to compete against themselves, right? So I set this goal, and if I meet my goal, I get a prize. Or they had participation um, prizes. So we would have a program. The more you came, every time you came, you got to put your name into a hat. And at the end, we picked multiple people out and you won through a raffle. Um, we also found that we started doing everything at work, right? And once people built their self-efficacy, then we started transferring it into, how are you gonna do this at home? How are you gonna bring your kids into it? How are you gonna work with your spouse or your friends? And we actually found that people organized walkathons on the weekend, came in on their days off to exercise or, came out on the weekends or after shifts to exercise with the team. But we found it was really important to start first with their work time. Again, remember we did everything during paid work time. And we really emphasized simple changes, right? Simple changes for the organization. You're not gonna change a culture of an organization overnight, just like you're not gonna change 20 plus years of habit in a week, right? So it's a lifelong change starting with simple successes and building on that. One of the things that I'm really proud of for our program is we had some pretty good participation. If you look at kind of overall well, uh, worksite wellness, it's about a 33% participation. If you look in the hospitals, it's about, um, it could be up to as low as 11%. Um, our program, depending on, we offered multiple programs and different types and different projects, but it ranged anywhere from 16 to 55%. For example, exercise programs always the most popular versus like setting goals, people that was like the lowest attended. Um, when we did an analysis of what was there any predictors, health demographic, anything that predicted who participated, the only thing that really came out was stress, personal stress and job stress. Those who were less stressed, two times more likely to participate. When we asked people what their barriers were, two biggest things we heard, time, and lack of support. And so I'm really excited that there are so many leaders on this call because your, your influence and your motivation and your role modeling is key. And so they setting that example and allowing that permission and you leading that from the top is absolutely instrumental. I can tell you right now, we're rolling out a project, um, another worksite wellness project, and that's the biggest thing we're hearing right now, lack of support over, um, over time. 
I know we don't have time to get into all this. I just wanted to save it in case we needed it. Um, these are some of the barriers that we faced. And then we worked with the staff to come up with some solutions, right? And so not only did they help us identify what the barriers were, but they came up with the solutions and then helped us implement, implement those solutions. Okay, so what changes can we make? Now the fun stuff. So these are just some examples, right? So if you have a gym, maybe allowing the employees to use the gym, they can take 10 breaks or they can come in early or they could um, do it before they leave. We also found that people didn't wanna sweat while they were at work, right? Simple solution, we got fans and put them right next to all the exercise equipment. Um, if you have a Wii or gaming system or any type of exercise stuff for the residents, is there a way to incorporate staff and residents exercising together? Could you do walking rounds? Could you, for example, when I'm at Maryland, I try to do a lot of walking meetings with the place out and get my team out and about. For diet stuff, we found that the, one of the best um, incentives actually was healthy food. People were interested in trying new things, but they didn't want to waste their very tight budget on things that they or their family might not like. So we just did healthy grocery bags. We also, of course, you can do potlucks, recipe swaps. We also found putting people into teams or small cohorts and having one person cook on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, going throughout the week, that also decreased the load of everyone having to cook, was accountable, right? And then also created groups and social connection. And then also people were eating healthy and trying new things. Stress. So there's a bunch of different activities um, for stress. These are some small things that could be done. Um, <clears throat> so for example, when I start class, when I start meetings, it's just kind of in the culture of what I do. We always start with like a stress activity. We start with a deep breathing, a gratitude practice, and it just sets the tone. When we do huddles for the day, we try to get into our, what's the vision of why we're here for service? How do we get into a good mental space to do that? How do we have a good set space before we leave? Um, if you're not comfortable leading meditations or deep breathing exercises, right? There's a free app, Insight Timer, you could, Download that site. You can search for like a two minute meditation. There's music, guided meditations, exercises, affirmations, whatever kind of fits the flow of your unit or team. Um, another organization got bucket drops to practice gratitude and posted them up around all of the, like if you did something nice for someone and filled their bucket, you would write it on a drop stick it on the person's door, right? So you were able to express gratitude, have connection with your team. It was the visual reminder every time you saw it. Um, another thing you could do is we have um, positive boards that talk about what it is that you're gonna do to make a change. Helps keep people accountable. You also learn from your coworkers. Um, doing, learning, starting a staff meeting with new concepts, self-compassion, five, four, three, two, one exercises when people are stressed. Um, there's, you can go to the Greater Good Science Center and put on a happiness calendar and pick something new every day. Um, again, I talked about that kind of that mental space out, leaving that stress at work. Um, one of the organizations we worked at didn't have like an official break room. So we, very, for very low cost, we bought a TV, a radio, worked with maintenance to move some of the supplies around to create a small staff space so they could relax. If you find that sleep is the thing that people want to work on, right? How am I going to work on sleep? Like what's a small thing you could do to get started right away? You could do some sleep education, talk with folks about, you know, when are they eating their caffeine? When are they exercising? When are they eating? What are their hygiene habits? What is their routine? Have them set goals. Maybe do a positivity board of the change they're going to make. And then at the next staff meeting, hold people accountable to that kind of starting that conversation and culture. Um, I, uh, at my facility, I always, I talk to my team about when are they taking vacation? I encourage vacation. I have an out of office assistant, um, not out, I'm sorry. My signature on my email says, you don't need to respond to me outside of work hours. I really try and set the culture and the expectation for my team to engage in wellness um, and to be able to take that break. I also talk to them. This, uh, this is an example of what I was saying about um, from your leadership role. I talked to them about my struggles as a uh, parent and how to balance that and let them know that it's safe to kind of come with me and come to me with those issues and we can problem solve, right? I have a three and a five-year-old. I totally get it. How can we be flexible and help each other out? And the team all kind of pitches in together to work um, to support each other. So some last final thoughts before we open it up for conversation. 
And so I just kind of spitfired a few things at you, but you know your organizations, right? You don't have to cram something in that's not going to work at your organization. This is the opportunity to tailor it really, because those are the things that are successful when you tailor it into the culture and flow of your work. This is a small little seed, right? We're going to build a lot of little seeds to get to that beautiful, lush, visual, happy place, but we're going to start small. Um, start with your low-hanging fruit, the easiest thing. It's very cyclical and iterative, and that's okay, and that's normal, right? We're all going to collaborate and brainstorm together, get a champion, get somebody else that you can work with together to start those changes. And the last thing I want to leave you with is to not underestimate your power as a leader, right? To role model, to set the tone. One of my favorite things about leadership or mentoring and working with a team is you really get to set that tone and that culture. Um, and so the last thing that I wanna say is thank you so much for your attention. I really am excited to hear some of the ideas that you all have for your organization and some questions. Great, Kelly, thank you. There, you've packed a lot into a really short presentation, thank you. We did have a couple of questions um, during your presentation about what is available um, you know, through your research and the, in that last sort of conglomerate slide where you had all those ideas about things that people could try. Um, what's, what's available to folks in this community um, from that menu of things that you showed there? This one, yeah. Yeah, so all of this stuff is free, right? So the Greater Good Science Center is an amazing resource out of UC Berkeley that produces these calendars. They also have 10-minute happiness po podcast exercises that you could do with your team, Insight Timer. We actually, even though we have trained interventionists to work um, facilitating our project, we really try and incorporate a lot of public and free things because when we leave, the employees are going to need to implement this to sustain it, right? And so I think that's one of the reasons we've been pretty successful with employees and facilities maintaining those changes after we leave is because we try and do things that are available. So that Insight Timer app is free. Um, all of these things, right? Kristen Neff and Chris Charmer from Self Compassion. There's you can Google Self Compassion, and there's like a five minute Self Compassion break that you could start with your team, or um, if you're processing a death or something difficult that's happened, like a sentinel incident, using that like mindful break that's publicly available. Um, I, did that answer the question? I, I, I think so. Yeah. Sorry, I know we have a little bit of feedback. Um, I, I wanted to open it up to the group for questions and I actually have a couple questions, um, but I wanna see what the group has first. And if you wanna stop sharing, Kelly, um, I know we have some folks, yeah, we have some folks who are on camera and then I'll be able to see, does anybody have a question for Kelly? Amy's hand is up. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> Hi, uh, Amy Berman from the John A. Hartford Foundation. Um, I just want to say how very much I appreciated the presentation, Kelly, and in particular, the, the data, the profile of staff um, so that you can understand the interventions that might be helpful to your care force. Um, that framing was fantastic. Of the, the uh, array of um, health and wellness interventions that you have put into place, I'm just wondering the feedback, what has been the most well-received um, uh, components of, of the intervention? <laughs> That's a great question and it's very difficult because I think it depends on facilities, right? So after we finish the project, we'll go back and do focus groups with all of the intervention sites. And so for example, like one thing that's bringing out is the dietary staff were like, wow, I learned so much and it completely changed how I cooked for the residents. And so yeah. that was really meaningful to them. I think some of the direct care staff, they loved the stress interventions. Some of them were like office or admin people liked the physical activity. So um, I, I think what we've learned in, in our current project, I will just say, um, is I think the stress piece is critical. Everybody said that stress was such a barrier. And so if it's not addressed, and you can teach people to like deep breathe all day long, but if the culture is stressful, like we have to kind of work at it from an organizational level, 
and an individual level. And so that's what now we're working on changing, working with the organizations before we even roll out these projects to work on stress before and then do individual level interventions. And Kelly, Leslie Eber asked in the chat, what was the most successful stress intervention that you've used or seen in your work? Um, so we typically do um, like a, if we get 15 minutes where people kind of cycle in and we do two minutes of like an education and while we're doing a warm up, 10 minutes of exercise and then two minutes of a, a cool down. And we also do stress there. And so usually um, it's more like deep breathing, yoga, gratitude. It's something that you can do in like two minutes, like a more of like a mindfulness activity and then doing kind of like a self-efficacy check with like how that felt with them afterwards and any changes we found were most helpful. Great. Thank, thanks, Kelly. And Nancy Zions has a hand raised and has a question. Yeah, I, I really appreciated this as well. Harkening back to the original wellness interventions that were put out 15 years ago, 20 years ago, they would say the fat people and the smokers are costing us more money on our health insurance. So here are the programs we're going to put in place to save us money on our health insurance. It was almost that obvious in how they introduced things. The idea that this is structured around what's in it for the care force so that they can um, be healthy and grow as people, to me, is a, a very important lens that, that this work seems to be. I've seen um, some organizations that have done things as simple as get the local farmer's market to set up in their parking lot on Tuesday mornings because some of your employees live in food deserts, don't have access to those fruits and vegetables on the beautiful posters. And wouldn't it be nice if there was some partnership you know, to bring that sort of healthy food and whatever in, in closer to them on their parking lots. But I think that um, you can't get away from the culture piece. What we hear more and more over the last two years are particularly people who work in nursing facilities talking about the moral injury, the physical injury, and the lack of attention to their grief, whether it was a loss that was incurred in their family or the losses all around them in the nursing home. And those pieces of attending to mental health related issues, a little bit different even than stress, but just that recognition of the fact that we know that the environment here is toxic. And how can we fix that together? Because we feel it as managers, you feel it as frontline staff, but uh, the tendency is to hide that sort of stuff. But I think that everybody feels it. And I think that um, some of these programs here could get to those issues in, in, in a very positive way. So thanks for some of those great ideas. Thanks, Nancy. I, a follow up on that for you, Kelly, is um, if you've seen a shift, you've been operating programs and conducting your research pre-COVID and now, you know, I don't know how much through COVID, but post-COVID, what kinds of changes have you seen in the stresses for the care force, their receptivity to programs? Um, are, are things maybe in some communities that were available sort of fell apart during COVID and they haven't restarted them? Like what's the impact been that you've seen in your work? Yeah, so I think that there's it's a lot harder to for facilities to figure out how to how to get this going during COVID because everyone is stretched so thin and it feels like one more thing. Um, and I think what we're trying to do right now, because like I said, we're actively recruiting in long-term care for um, like a year-long project like this. And so we're really trying to just take time, build relationships, understand the work culture and working with stakeholders that can inform us on the best things for that organization and really kind of help understand the why. So like I said, the first three months before you enroll out the intervention, we're looking to the team to tell us what are the sources of stress, what are the solutions, and we have money and expertise to then put towards that to try and reduce some of those barriers and provide support. And um, I don't know, hopefully that answered your question. Well, it sounds, yes, it did. It sounds like you're sort of shifting um, even to a more co-design kind of effort to really get at what, what the folks lived experience is. 
Um, I had, there are a couple other questions in the chat. Um, Perva asked, um, Perva from Shaw from the International Society for Chronic Illnesses, uh, wanted to know if these techniques, what you've been doing will work with medical students and recent medical graduates who are working with people with chronic conditions in their program. Any um, thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I truly believe, right? If you look at healthcare in general, not singling out just med students, right? But if you look at healthcare providers, we typically have worse health outcomes than like the VA did a great study a while back of looking at healthcare providers and breaking them out by their classifications and then comparing them to the US population. And we typically have worse health outcomes, right? And so how, how can we get our healthcare staff to engage in those behaviors? Because if we do, right, we're going to think it's so wonderful and we're gonna share that wealth of information with everyone else and we're gonna increase our self-efficacy and belief in it and we're gonna to wanna to share it. And so in our prior projects, we really have seen a spillover effect and we have some preliminary quantitative data and definite qualitative data that says there's a spillover when you work with the care team to the residents. So I think that would be a great value. Great, thank you. Sabine, you had your hand up. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, and I, what is a, a huge pain point um, uh, right now for companies and for facilities is employee turnover. In fact, it's gonna be a quality measure. Um, have you had any data on how that may improve um, or health system may, or this initiatives like these improve employee turnover? And then a second question, I see several um, uh, several CMOs here and, and, and other people who are in leadership position. I am looking at this and I'm like, this is great, but I'm a little overwhelmed um, thinking, how can I actually, you know, initiate something like that on a CMO level? Um, and, and I love Leslie's question, simple and <laughs> simple and actionable. But, but I'd, I'd love to hear about uh, those two questions. Thank you. Um, so that, that the question about turnover, there is mixed literature if wellness programs prevent turnover. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the length of the program and then the comprehensiveness of the program. We have not looked at that in our projects. We've only looked at um, workability. So I can't, and there's not that I, I can't think of anything within healthcare that looked at wellness programs and prevention turnover. Um, for the second point, I completely understand that this is overwhelming and it's a huge hurdle and one more thing. I think an easy way to start would to, to be to try and pull in one or two other allies that would be similar focused. And it could either, it could be a frontline worker or another um, director of nursing or another supervisor someone else that could get a sense of one area, right? There's tons of health behavior changes, but one area that you wanna focus on and maybe it's even starting a culture shift of if it's diet, what would that look like, right? Are you maybe making some cafeteria changes? Are you changing the culture of what it is when if you buy food or food at meetings or starting small with like, a, like I was saying about the um, organizing cohorts to bring in food and they cook for like the team, like one unit, you sign up and I'm going to cook on Mondays and you then bring in the recipe so other people can share. Um, it's, I guess it's a hard answer because it's really, that's the, where I was trying to get at that visual. You can't push that square peg into that round hole. Like you really need to understand what your facility is interested in, because if, if they're interested in sleep and you're talking about smoking, it's not going to resonate well. Um, I don't know if that's answering your question. We're not specific enough. And I think that's really helpful, Kelly, because I was also thinking like, is there one place you, that you really could start because there tends to be a sense of urgency around it or it's easiest place to start. But I, what I hear you saying is, you know, it really depends. It depends on your stakeholders there and what would be most interesting to them. Um, it makes sense. If I could just say something, I think it's important that whoever leads the effort in an organization, it not be phony. 
So you, you not pick the one person that you know just destroys the culture and you're going yeah. to put them out front as the leader of this thing. You know what I mean? So that that to me may be a first place to start is with who's the right formal and informal leader for this. Yeah, and that's a, thank you, Nancy. That's a question in the chat too, um, who tends to be the leaders. Um, you, Kelly, seem to be speaking to like find a champion, like to Nancy's point, find somebody who really could get engaged in this and promote and be a part of it. But who, who de does tend to be sort of the driving force in any community to get it done? It's, it's really interesting. Again, I know it's this, I, I know you probably want a super specific answer, but in one facility, it was the um, executive director's assistant. In another facility, it was the activities manager. It really just depends who's going to have that authentic yeah. passion about it and then also has respect from the community to kind of lead it. So find that, find that person with the passion. Excuse me, Joanne, it's Margo. I don't know how to make that hand raise thing or I would do that. Oh, sorry, Margo. Go ahead. <laughs> it's okay. I don't know how to make that thing work. So my question is, have um, Kelly, have you tried this in an assisted living community where you have so much less or fewer available staff on any shift? Have you tried that? Have, have any of the principals or have you done a program in an assisted living community? Yeah, so we've worked in um, uh, assisted living, memory care, independent living, um, nursing home. And so some of the things I think probably if I had to give one answer of the easiest way to get staff, like even if you could just get five minutes of their time, yeah. you typically find that like the change of shift, if you're looking for direct care staff, like if they leave at three o'clock, right, they might be giving their report, but probably like 310, 315, they have some time. Um, and you're able to kind of capitalize on that. The other things we've done with when there's smart, small staff is we kind of created this culture of like a buddy system. And so they would cover for each other. And we'd have some facilities had a sign out board. Some facilities had like, I'm going to hand you my pager or my phone. Other people had rotating days of who their coverage person was. It just, again, I know it's not a direct answer, no, no. but we really just had to make it from what the facility like we, we almost did like a brainstorming session and we're like, these are gonna be the challenges. Help me think through how this is gonna work here. And then how, how, what do you need to do to make that happen? And my other piece of that question is, based on all of the DEI information going on and social determinants and all of that, what kinds of information, if any, did you collect prior to starting any kind of a program? Did you find out how many immigrants were in the building working? Um, who was new, who was not, who was on food stamps, who was not, who could not have access to fresh fruits and vegetables? I mean, we're finding out that people are given orders by a physician that they can't possibly follow because they don't have access to the product or can't afford the medication or whatever. Was any of that built into what you did? Yes. And so I recognize this part is probably intensive and might, you know, we have the luxury of having a team of people doing this, but to, we found that we were going to go in and talk about food groups and we had to take it back 10 notches of like, what is in a food group and right. how, like, how do you read a food label? And we also, does, does you know, McDonald's count? <laughs> yeah. And so how, when you, how do you portion control and all that kind of stuff? So, um, we found that it was helpful to do one-on-one -on -one interactions. And we honestly, like when we started, we didn't even get into education for like the two, like maybe like six weeks or four weeks at, the, at minimum. And we just did all fun stuff, right? That we worked on like exercise or things that they wanted to work on. And then once they built some trust in us, then they were like, then they would come to you and be like, I don't really understand this. Can you explain it to me? But it was more in a one-on-one -on -one interaction. Okay. Right? Well, great questions. Uh, Kelly, I have a feeling we could go on and on. Um, and certainly, um, please, anyone who has addition, additional questions or ideas, please go out um, to the, the website where we're interacting. I'm going to ask Aaron to um, say a word about that and, and invite folks out there to keep the conversation going. And remind you that August 25th is our next session and we look forward to seeing you there. Erin, um, any final words before we close today? 
Thank you so much, Kelly. That was terrific, as expected. Um, we actually were going to go into breakout sessions, but there were so many great questions for Kelly, we didn't want anyone to miss out. So, um, But please visit our website at paltc.org slash good thing. I have it in the chat there. We can probably post it again. And if you'd like to keep the discussion going, we have an email listserv so that you can sign up for that and email each other and keep these discussions and ideas going um, on the website. This also was recorded and that will be posted posted um, probably by early next week. And so you can access that and please feel free to share it with your colleagues. And you can e email me directly. I'll put that in the chat as well. I'd love to hear your feedback on these, um, all of the roundtables to date and what strategies that you find helpful and that you plan to start in your own community. Um, as this winds up in September, we're gonna be pulling out all of the great tidbits and ideas we've developed over these roundtable discussions and find a way to beautifully package it and get those out to disseminate. So. I appreciate all your questions and, and attendance today, and we look forward to seeing you the end of August. Thank you. Thanks again, Kelly. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody. Have, Thank you. have a great summer. Thank you. Bye.